Okay. Welcome, welcome back to the channel. Uh, this is Conversations with Carnivores. My name is Christina. I'm a naturopath, herbalist, life coach, as well as carnivore myself. And this is where I have conversations essentially with other people who have gone on this journey of uh, ad adapting to a carnivore lifestyle or a carnivore way of eating. So today I've got Andy with me. Uh, he's going to be sharing about his journey. Um, so let's kick it off. Welcome to the channel, Andy. Uh, thanks, Christina. I'm very happy to be here. Awesome. So the first question that I generally ask people is, one, how long have you been carnivore now? It's the best part of a year now. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So what took you on the journey to go carnivore? Like what was the instigator for you? Um, I, like most things, I promised my wife I would. She died uh, six years ago. Yeah. Um, from breast cancer and after I looked after her for, for the last couple of years of her life um, I had let myself go and I was 136 and a half kilos mm -hmm. and she wanted me to look after myself uh, she made me promise to join the men's shed and she made me promise to get fit. Uh, initially, I, I went on a keto diet. Oh, well, yep. eventually I went on a keto diet uh, and got so far and and that worked. And then Jordan Peterson and Michaela Peterson convinced me that carnivore diet was probably the way to go. Yeah. So I love that your wife had the forethought there of like he needs to join the men's shed and he needs to get himself fit uh, and to, to make you promise those things. And I love that you followed through on your promises. <laughs> well done. So yes, I'm, cur you. I'm curious then, like for you, that transition from keto to carnival, what was that like for you? Was that hard or easy or like what came up for you? No, it took a long time. No, no. Because I was a, I was a snacker, and like you, I believe uh, I'm a um, carb addict. Mm -hmm. so I was, and I loved cheese, so I was snacking on nuts and cheese uh, on keto, uh, and gallons of cream. I was buying two, over two liters of cream a fortnight. Oh wow. <laughs> This was during uh, lockdown, of course. Yep. I, I've been shopping once a fortnight. Um, and uh, funnily enough, I didn't lose weight. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I was, so one by one, I was discarding food, food groups and food types. Yep. And eventually, uh, let's say, Especially under the influence of uh, of Jordan Peterson, Michaela Peterson, and Sean Baker, I uh, I decided to go the whole hog. And the very last thing that I discarded was was dairy. Yeah. Uh, because I was drinking gallons of full cream milk as well. Uh, and then I discovered that. Um, I was allergic to dairy. Huh? It had been causing my ulcerative colitis. Oh, wow. Which is an incredibly unpleasant illness. Yes. Um, uh, uh, cause, causing me to have to go through extreme measures to, to overcome it. Yep. Um, yeah. And, and once I... Once I go about dairy, it it's got better. I'm still on a couple of tablets. Yeah. But um, but I'm very very much. <laughs> I love that. It's interesting because like I do have a, uh, I have a whole bunch of patients with ulcerative colitis, and um, it is not a not a pleasant condition. You are often you know exactly where all the bathrooms are at any given time in any given moment wherever you are. Uh, just in case and often for a lot of people it can be debilitating in the sense that they just don't go out anymore they just stay home because it's easier 
than to try and navigate the outside world. Yeah. yeah it's, so to it's a big time and come out of it is life changing. I have yeah. a brother in I have a brother in Malaysia, and he likes me to visit occasionally. Um, and I uh, and I let my passport lapse because there was no way I could ever fly. Mm -hmm. But yep. now I've got my passport again. <laughs> so it's almost like you've gotten freedom back when, yeah, with, with that yeah. transition for sure. Yeah. So I'm, cu I'm curious, like, um, what are some of the benefits um, you've the, seen? Well, the other thing is that it's easy. It's like all these things. Mm. I'm, a, I'm an addictive personality. I was a, addicted to cigarettes. The only way to st stop cigarettes uh, was to stop and not not ever smoke again. Yeah. That was in 1996. A good good friend in the UK, uh, sounds strange, took me to his um, uh, uh, cottage in Wales and virtually kept me in communicado, but I couldn't buy cigarettes for two days. And that was it. Fixed it. Yeah. Uh, and once I went carnivore, uh, and stopped eating carbs. It was easy. I'm not yes. hungry. I, I was hum always craving foods when I was when I was eating um, carbs. And as soon as I gave them all up, it became a simple matter. Feeding myself is easy. I'm a good cook. Uh, so um, it takes me six minutes to cook my midday meal and my evening meal. Yeah. And and I'm not hungry in between. And I don't want a snack. Everything's easy. I, th I think that that's the interesting thing because like, I, I don't think people quite believe me when I talk about carnivore from a cost perspective because when I talk about it from a cost perspective, I'm like, you've also got to think about that I might be eating two times most of the like twice a day most of the time sometimes occasionally three and I'm not really snacking in between like I'm not even I'm not buying the apples or I'm not buying the cheese or I'm not yeah. buying a bag of chips I'm not buying like any of these other like morning tea afternoon tea dessert type things like so the cost wise like yes meat itself costs more than say a loaf of bread but I eat one steak versus like how much of a loaf of bread could I actually consume? Plus what else do I need to then consume to fill myself up? Because it just keeps you being hungry all the time. That's absolutely right. I, I buy myself a rump steak. Uh, I have my butcher trained to uh, cut it with all the fat and gristle in it. Uh, and I eat it. And that lasts me two weeks. Yeah. Uh, a full a full lump. And I now buy an MSA Meat Services Australia, whatever it is, standards yep. Australia. Graded graded rump. So that, that costs me ten dollars a day. Yeah. And then a couple of eggs on top. And in the evening I I have at the moment I have black pudding. A black sausage, yes, um, and a couple of eggs. I eat four eggs a day. Some black sausage and and a lump doesn't cost that much, and there's nothing rotting in the fridge. That's exactly, it. there's no food waste. Like there's like at my place, if you don't eat it, then the dogs will eventually eat it. So you know, there's <laughs> definitely no food waste whatsoever uh, in, in that regard. But I can tell you when we were having a diet that was like full of bread and full of other stuff, there was always food waste. There was always yeah. stuff that was, you know, you're always pulling out old veggies that were sitting in the back of the fridge that, you know, you didn't want to eat or maybe you'd forgotten about, but we're off. It doesn't happen with my steak. <laughs> and, and I think I'm lucky in that uh, I, I've got a very high threshold of boredom for food. I, I enjoy steak and, and sausage and eggs and, uh, if I want to change it up, I, I cook the eggs differently. Yep. <laughs> Most of I the time I, po I poach them. Yep. Uh, but in in the evening, I'm frying them 
and I only use um, uh, beef dripping to, to yep. fly in. So I think from the boredom, boredom aspect, I know a lot of people kind of go into that space of going, oh, I'd be so bored eating the same thing every day. Well, one, you don't have to just eat steak, for example. You could certainly be eating like, you know, different types. You could eat like lamb, goat, et cetera. Like, you know, there's lot, lots of different yeah. types of, of meat. But also from the egg perspective, you could eat duck eggs, you could eat um, quail eggs, you could eat chicken eggs. It doesn't have oh. to be the exact same thing all the time. Um, but the other thing for me is that, when all your adventure comes from food, then I think maybe your life's a bit too boring. Maybe you need to get some more adventure in your actual life as well. Yeah, it is like filling the car up now. It, it's not it's not something I do for pleasure. I, as I said, I'm, I'm not a bad cook and I do miss cooking. So a couple of weekends ago, I, I cooked a Sunday lunch for somebody. Um, yep. A full English with... Yorkshire pudding and roast and vegetables and and uh, thick gravy and all that and I just had the meat, um, so that was fun. I mean, I, so I enjoyed doing that just for, just for a change. Occasionally, I will go and do some of like not very often because I'm I'm pretty busy, um, but occasionally I'll go and do some of the things like um, there's a carnivore mashed potatoes. Like I'll go and I'll go to the extent of making the carnival mashed potatoes and I'll go to the extent of making like maybe a carnival loaf of bread. It's very, very rare that I do these things because I'm mostly too lazy to do so um, and too busy. I mean, I do have seven children and a whole life that's going wow. on. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but when I do get that cooking bug in me, I, I, just, I go and try and play with some of the carnivory recipes out there. Right. Yes, I, I, I'm. Uh, I just pass because all, almost all of them. Uh, no, uh, I, I just didn't didn't feel the need for them. I have yeah. been looking at various different meats. I, I had a week where in the evening, I was eating salmon instead of the sausage, mm -hmm. uh, and lost another two and a half kilos. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I stopped that. <laughs> Because I, I think I'm down at my, my optimum weight, you know, I'm about, I'm about 80 kilos. Yeah. I started at 136 and a half. And I think 80 is light enough for somebody of my height. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that, that, I think that's actually part of the challenge that a lot of women have, like, is the under eating, like that you actually feel so satisfied and full that it's really easy to under eat when it comes to carnivore and often I actually have to stretch them and go, no, you have to eat a little bit more than this or a, you're going to stop like the, the healing process that you're, you're going on because there won't be enough to go around. Uh, but also yeah. it's just that you, you're often really full and satisfied, but you don't feel like you need any more food, but sometimes we have to eat a little bit extra to make sure that we're ma maintaining our actual needs. So I'm curious for you, what have been some of the challenges for you on Carnivore? Uh, really starting, really only starting, because once I was on Carnivore, everything, everything's easy. I don't get hungry. I don't want to snack. Um, I still uh, drink a glass or two of red most yep. evenings. I have a, had the odd evening off just to prove I can. Um, but I can drink within reason. Yeah. Uh, just I, I feel feel well. Uh, all my diseases, illnesses have disappeared. Um, ulcerative colitis being the main one. Yeah. Sleep ap sleep apnea, hypertension. I have cardiac issues, but there's nothing much I can do about that, I don't believe. Yeah. I'd be interested, I'd be interested to have a calcium CAC yeah. test. Because <clears throat> the last time I I had a CAC, uh, the the video showed me um showed my arteries like Christmas tree lit up with calcium. Yeah. And I 
think it's probably cleared now. But I, I can't tell without going back. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if you do get another one in the future, what that actually what that actually comes back as. That'll be interesting. Yeah. Yes. My my um my ejection traction from my cast has improved. Yeah. So uh, so that's good. But I got a I got a pacemaker. Um and uh, there's not much I can do about that. Yeah. All you can do is is really get yourself into the optimal position, and then you know that, that like that's the best that you you're probably going to be able to do at this point in time is be optimal. Um, but it's interesting yeah. that I I have a number of um, cardiac patients who have had like a bypass done and those types of things, and they they come they come to me and I go I think like the fastest way to get you where you want to go is to go carnivore. And they're a little bit apprehensive because it's all the fear stuff that their doctors have put into them about don't eat fat and saturated fat yeah. is bad and and so on. And then they they get across that. I'm like, J let's just do three months, right? Let's do 90 days and see how we go. And by the end of the 90 days, they go back to their doctor and their doctor was like, wow, what have you done? You're looking amazing. Like, you know, they've been able to run on their stress test when before they were barely walking on their stress <laughs> test. Like, but then they tell their doctor what they've done and then all of a sudden you see this panic that go across the doctor's face. They're like, oh, well, we better run all of these blood tests now just in case. But it's like night and day for them in regards to the results that they've been able to get after recovering from their heart attack and their bypass surgeries and so on. But it's still interesting to see how apprehensive the allopathic medicine model is of their results and so on. So. Yes. I'm curious, how are your doctors taking it? Uh, they're all they're all opposed to what, I, <laughs> to what I'm doing. <laughs> um, except, may, except maybe my my gastroenterologist. Yep. Uh, but certainly my um, cardiac cardiologist uh, is strongly opposed to it thinks I should work, eat a, what they call a balanced diet. Yeah. Um, I took myself off, uh, off Crestor uh, mm -hmm. last year. And, yep. and my GP and him uh, both think that I should be on, on, uh, on Crestor. I, I'm curious about your results. Like, are they looking at your blood tests and going, wow, okay, these things are looking a bit better. And yes, cholesterol yeah. tends to go up, but other than that, everything else tends to look pretty good um, for, yeah. for a lot of people. Is that sort of the common thing for you? I don't, well, I don't care about cholesterol. <laughs> and, I, and I tell them that. So, uh, yeah. You, uh, they said, I think this is a, a bit high. So, well, you, you might well think it's high. <laughs> my uh, endo my endocrinologist said if I was you I'd still be on on the um what uh, on the crystal I'm trying to remember what the uh, what the medical name for crystal is uh, so so good so uh, no, no. um the yeah and and I said I'm sure you I'm sure you would but but I I don't think it's the biggest risk to me. Mm -hmm. I think the basic biggest risk is the diabetes. Yeah. So I'm I'm trying to get rid of insulin from my my system. Yeah. How close are you? I well I don't know because I can only I can only tell by uh, secondary factors. I I am con constantly in ketosis. Yeah. Uh, I and my blood sugar is steady around 6.5. Yeah. So you, you're probably not that far away um, at that well, point at 6.5. Yeah. My uh, my ketones are 0.8 uh, yep. uh, constantly. Yeah. So if those ketones um, get up a little bit higher, then you, you'll come down even, even more. Well, I yes. But it's likely to cause more weight loss. <laughs> well, not necessarily. So the key is when you go into ketosis is remembering that your primary energy source when you're in ketosis is fat. And so if you are 
more protein, then that will you will lose weight. But if you are eating more fat, then you won't lose any weight. So the key is that if you do notice that your ketones are going up, is to make sure that you're adding more fat to your actual diet because you want the you want the energy to be coming from what you're eating versus what's coming off of your body. So it's the reverse for people who want to yeah. lose weight. <laughs> Once yeah. they're in ketosis, we want to drop the fat that they're eating so that they take the fat off their body. But when you've reached the point where you've got enough fat and, and stuff on your body, you want to start eating enough fat to make sure that you're bringing in enough fuel for for your needs for the day. So it's just when you get to that point, just lift up your fat intake a bit more. Okay. It's just a nice yeah. little balancing act that <laughs> takes place there. Um, but that will be the thing that will bring down your blood glucose to that point where you can go, yep, I know I know, my insulin's good, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Maybe I should start scrambling my egg with, uh, with dripping. Well, that or the other thing that some people do is they'll add a couple of extra egg yolks to it so instead of having the egg whites because the egg whites is where the primary protein is and the yolk is where pr the primary fat is and so they'll yeah. have like scrambled eggs and you know say two scrambled eggs with two extra egg yolks uh, and that will be enough to actually bump up their fat a little bit more um, and help them keep up their fat needs but that's where duck eggs are helpful because the, the yolks are a lot bigger than a chicken egg um, oh, I like duck eggs yeah. The question that I have for you is how do you mentally deal with having medical people around you telling you that you're doing the wrong thing consistently? Like how do you deal with that? Because I know that's a challenge for a lot of people when they go well, to their doctor because we're born trained, well, we're trained to actually trust our doctors and listen to what they have to say to us. And, you know, if in your case, and I know in my case, at some point a doctor has saved me and kept me alive. And so, how do you how do you yeah, deal with that for those that are so, home? Same that are... here. I've had quintuple bypass. I've had um, uh, triple A um, uh, abdominal uh, aortal aneurysm. I'm dacron from just south of my uh, diaphragm to the top of my legs. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm already a bionic man. Um, <laughs> Uh, and doctors have indeed uh, saved me, um, uh, but I am 73 and I'm bloody-minded old man, and I can I can handle myself. <laughs> Unfortunately, I lose words, um, like statin, which was the word yep. I was, which was the word I was looking for earlier when I went, yep. went off in the dream, and. And it spoils my argument. So that that's a regret because I can't argue clearly and, and lucidly when when I'm talking to them. Yeah. It, it comes to me later, this Brie But yeah. Never It'll mind. be interesting for me if you find that that starts to quicken because there's two things for me. When when people lose words, it's a adrenal stress. So their adrenals are a little bit tired and fatigued. Um, and all the statins are going to do that to you, right? <laughs> like that's yeah. part of the, the repercussions of taking a statin. So it'd be interesting for me that like as you progress, if you actually start to notice a mental sharpness start to come more and more. Uh, well, it certainly has. No, before I, before I uh, went carnivore, um, I was starting to get very foggy and and it's come back. Yep. Uh, the clarity of... Uh, of um, mentation, yeah. So that that's the, one of the best things. Yeah. Of course, I regret not doing it earlier. Of course, and, me too. <laughs> and I regret. I I think there is a chance that I could have extended my wife's life mm -hmm. with a carnivore lifestyle. Yeah. Not absolutely guaranteed because she like food as well you know but, um... and that that's always the challenge is like you know and I use carnivore with a lot of my oncology patients as well um but the challenge always is is what are willing what are people willing to actually give up um 
for not a guaranteed outcome. There's there's never going to be a guaranteed outcome and you don't know which way, you know, thing, things can go for sure 100%. Um, but it's hard, it's hard to do stuff for other people. Like they've got to choose it as well. But yeah. at that point in time, you didn't know. So you didn't have the option to give that to her as a, as a choice. Um, I'm curious because here's something that I hear from some of my older patients and that is, and not all of them, but some of them, and that is, well, I'm going to die soon anyway. I might as well enjoy my life. And they go, I don't want to go carnival because then that means I miss out on the cake and all the other stuff. And that's me enjoying my life. What would you have to say to those people? Oh, well, um, your, your quality of life is also important. And it, um, going carnivore not only extends it, but it also um, improves the quality of your and miners. Miners improved out of all sight, out of all recognition, mainly the, the um, ulcerative colitis, sleep apnea, um, ulcers, mouth ulcers, skin conditions, uh, have all improved on on uh, um, on carnivore. I sleep better, and I'm sharper. So, so what? So you live live a short, miserable life where you can eat cake. I think I'm, I think it, I I win. <laughs> really. <laughs> I love that. Well, I'm I'm with you. I'd much rather live a life where I'm able to actually do things and participate in it instead of being in that space of like being on a hundred different medications and potentially feeling like I'm being a burden because I can't look after myself anymore um, for a much longer period of time than needs to happen. One of the uh, I, I do feel guilty from time to time. For instance, I buy cakes. For, birth, for my birthday and stuff, I put them in shape and and, uh, and and biscuits and whatever. And um, <laughs> I participate in the budding sausage sizzle where I'm giving people bread and, and the sausage is yeah. okay, but the bread. And there seems to be an incredible trend for the mustard, the American mustard now. You look yeah. on the label, it's 85% sugar. Yep. And everybody smarms their sausages with essentially sugar paste. Yep. And I, I feel really guilty about it. And they drink soft drinks, of course, which are, which are ghastly. Terrible. I'm killing people. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> it's an interesting conversation because I did have someone, both of my kids work at takeaway shops. Like, one of my kids got a job at KFC and the other one got a job at McDonald's. So then they fight and argue about which is the better takeaway. Um, but I did get asked about how I feel as a naturopath supporting these companies. And I'm like, well, two things. One, that I know that most people who tend to work at those places stop eating those foods. So from my, my perspective, I'm like, yep, my kids are going to see behind the counter and how these things are made and they're most likely not going to want to actually eat those foods. But at the other end of it is that we have to allow people to have their own choice. Now, ideally, I wish we had an even playing field where, say, that mustard was actually advertised as what it was, which is a sugar paste versus mustard. Um, and the same with the bread was advertised as a loaf of sugar <laughs> as opposed yes. to actually being called bread. But at the same time, I also recognise that people need to come to their own conclusions about some of these things and have their own free will or... They, there's a level of resentment that comes about when we force these things upon people. But I wish the I wish the educational space was an even playing field, where we actually advertise things as they are versus the fruity flakes that we get and things like that that are like have no fruit in them. Can I can I ask you a, a question? You got five children, seven, and they do, do they all eat a carnivore way of eating? They don't eat 100% carnivore. So my big kids have all chosen to do 
um, ketovore. So they have a little bit of fruit and um, a little bit of like snacky stuff on an, on occasion. The the rule in my house is though that I buy the I buy the stuff that makes you live. If you want to buy stuff that makes you die, you pay for that. Okay. <laughs> and so from that perspective, and my little kids, um, they eat meat, fruit. We have occasionally some vegetables when we've got visitors over. Um, but other than that, we really don't have much vegetables at our place. Um, and occasionally they'll have some bread. But well, that's that where we go great. for a sourdough. Mm -hmm. Green leafy vegetables, not uh, not not starchy vegetables, I, I guess. Uh, mostly, like if somebody's visiting, we'll probably have some carrots. That's pretty, like carrots and maybe broccoli. Like it's just yeah. a thing that I can buy in a small bag because I don't want a ton of it at my house to to feed other people when they come over, and that's yeah. what they expect. Yes, yeah, so I've got I've got a bag of frozen beans in the freezer. <laughs> that's it. Yeah. That's interesting. My, uh, my husband is not a, my husband's not carnivore, so it makes it a little bit harder. If he was carnivore, then the whole oh. household would be as well. But there's compromises when there's other people in the household. I have I have friends who uh, um, have children and who really would like to go carnivore, but they say they can't afford it. It's just because oh. because they got you know, teenage children who are gobbling down mounds of food all the time. Well, I did an experiment. So with my seven children, so my eldest is 20 and my youngest right. is 10, so seven in 10 years. And wow. they will go on my crazy experiments with me. And so I did a whole day of 100% carnivore for the whole family. It worked out to be a dollar seventy per meal per person for three meals for the day. Right. So... The answer of it's too expensive is not actually true. Right. <laughs> wow. So a well, dollar seventy per person per meal, um, and we didn't actually end up eating the last meal that much because we were all actually full. Uh, well, that corresponds with my experience, and so uh, yeah, uh, it, it's really taking the dive to to get into it. That's hard. It once, is once. Once you're in the pool and got your head wet, then yep. then it isn't that cold and it's actually quite fun and, and easy. Yeah, and I, I often say to people that it's more expensive at the start because at the start you need to eat more food to actually get in all of your nutritional stores. So if you've been lacking in iron and B vitamins and like all of your different minerals, if you've been depleted in all of those and you suddenly start to eat food that's going to give you those, you're going to be yeah. hungry to start with. And then it takes about two weeks usually for most people and about two weeks. And I say, just hold on. It inevitably comes. But once it comes, you'll be like, oh, God, I don't need to eat any more food. I'm so full. Uh, yeah. And it, it usually comes about two weeks in for some people, sometimes a little bit longer. Um, but that's where I say like, okay, in that period of time, go for the cheap cut, go and get like your chicken drumsticks and get whatever your chicken wings or whatever else is on special. So you've got extra food in your freezer so that it's, you know, you're picking the cheapest things there. But then once that hunger period finishes, you generally fall back into this like two meals a day, maybe three um, depending on how old the people are in your house is. I, I must say I, I prefer to, to eat ruminant meat, although yep. black sausage is pig. But but uh, but I wonder if um, if there's a market for camel and goat and uh, certainly buffalo. Buffalo is delicious. Buffalo oh, yep. steaks <laughs> better than beef. Um, uh, but it's also and venison of course but it's yep. so expensive to buy them it, sort of. it's interesting that camel is expensive here because we've got so many camels oh. that are pests they're just getting cold and left for wild dogs to actually eat oh. uh, and I'm like how we, why are we not using this as an actual resource for our people the same here in the snowy mountains where I am there's been um a big cull of of horses so we've got oh. all the wild horses that are living up in um in the mountains and they're killing them off because they're 
you know, destroying the agriculture and the like native land and they're just going to shoot them and leave them to die there. And I'm like, half the population, other parts of the world actually eat horse. Well, in Australia, we don't eat horse. We could actually be selling these to uh, like as a commodity at least as opposed to just letting it die and rot into the ground. Like, I've, I've been told that, that um, that's because the English, English yeah, heritage, is that century, uh, Australia, uh, the English uh, revered horses as gods. Mm. And you don't eat gods. <laughs> uh, that's, why, that's why we don't. But it, it's interesting that, like, I feel like in many ways we're very wasteful with these things, like camels, yeah. for example, that are being culled. Like, certainly that's meat that people could be eating. Same with the horses. The horses could be meat that people are eating, not necessarily if you don't want to eat it in Australia. Go to Saudi Arabia. If you want to order a steak in Saudi Arabia, the steak that you get is horse meat. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, and France. Yeah. Yeah. It's the same um, with what we we do with a lot of things. Like, you know, in Tasmania where I was living, they would release the Khaleesi virus to kill rabbits. I'm like, why are we not turning rabbits into food? Like, you know, it's not very hard to kill a rabbit and eat it. I've I've done it myself. Um, you know, we're we're yeah. so wasteful around these things when we could actually be turning it into something that's actually usable for us. As a as a kid, I, I, a child, I was brought up opposite a small family butcher uh, who used to do home killing, mm -hmm. so, and I was uh, sort of groupie of the uh, slaughtermen. So I used yeah. to go over, in the, go over in the evenings and help them um, uh, in the slaughter room. So, um, yes, I'm not, uh, I'm not particularly worried about that <laughs> side of things. Yeah. It, it's interesting, though, I, I think about it. Um, I think in some ways when you've had the opportunity to actually kill something and then eat it or consume it, there is a level of respect that's there when it comes to not wasting the animal and making the most out of it and like not cooking it in a really crap way either. <laughs> I, I agree. I've also had uh, cattle, on, I'm on acreage, and um, I've delivered calves. Uh, so I've been, been at both ends of the yep. uh, experience. Yeah. I think a well, lot of people miss that um, yeah they miss that whole completion of life of being in in all of the phases of it and recognizing that death is a part of life and i think probably that's where a lot of the vegan sort of movement has come out of is this disconnection with with reality and food and and ha like everything requires some level of death yes yeah it's very it's very sad because they really are missing out um, and um, and disrespecting mm. uh, and broad broad acre farming is is destroying the world anyway. I think yeah. I've, I, I'm a follower of Alan Savory and regenerative farming. Mm -hmm. And personally, I have four acres of bamboo on my on my land, so. Oh, I can be green and a carnival. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I'm curious for you, how have your friends and family gone with watching you go carnival? Um, my family has been very supportive, actually, because they saw how fat and miserable I was before. So the family's uh, very supportive. And my other friends have, uh, um, by and large, been um, uh, either just just passingly interested or, uh, oh, yes, uh, well, don't tell me. Not, in, not interested. <laughs> don't tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll stick with what I've got. Yeah. Has anyone joined you? Has anyone gone, oh, I'm so interested that they've actually joined you as well? So um, 
Some are, I think, on the journey, but haven't gone the full kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's likely that my masseurs will go carnivore. <laughs> uh, it's one of the, one of my treats besides my wine is having a fortnightly massage. Yeah. And, and she's she's the one with a couple of kids, uh, which is why I was asking. Yeah. Um, but I I think she would uh, she would try. It. For, for me, with kids without health problems, like if there's no health problems, I generally would go meat and fruit so that there's a little bit of fruit there, but predominantly the diet is like meat. And if they don't have any dairy problems, then some, some um, fermented dairy and those types of things, um, that tends to give them a little bit of options of things to actually consume and not looking massively different at school, uh, but also still managing to, to maintain health. Well, why why do you want to avoid the um, vegetables? Is that because that the lectins? Well, you and, for me, I sure would that. want to avoid the vegetables because of all of the um, because of all the plant chemicals in them. So there's lectins, yeah. but there's oxalates, and there's also you know there, there's yeah. hundreds and hundreds of different plant chemicals. But and this is the thing: like in an ideal world, if you've got the fruit tree in the backyard and you can see when that fruit is ripe and you can pick it when it's ripe that would be when I would consume that fruit simply because at that point in time, the plant chemicals are reduced. So there's still plant chemicals in there, but they've been reduced, which is why the birds and the bees, like you, if you, if you've ever had fruit trees outside, you know, there's a period of time where the birds are watching and they're waiting and they're waiting for the moment that it switches and it switches. And that's when it, when it does that switch is when the chemicals start to reduce it. The only time birds and insects are going to eat that fruit prior to the chemicals starting to lower in them as if they're starving because there's no other food around it, or that the tree is sick. If the tree is sick, it will eat them because there won't be a lot of plant chemicals in them. Um, but if the tree is strong and robust, it will wait until the fruit turns and then it's all on Red Rover, fight for who can get the fruit the fastest. But from the perspective of the vegetables, I would only choose fruit-based vegetables like zucchini, for example. Um, a cucumber, oh. things that are actually the fruit. But the problem is in our world as well, you know, if you've lived anywhere where they do farming, apples are picked well before they're actually ripe and then they're put yeah. into a, a cup, into a warehouse where they're artificially ripened when we want them to be ripe as opposed yeah. to them doing the natural process on the actual tree. So if it was me in an ideal world, I would choose fruit that is seasonally naturally ripened uh, and meats and and dairy and eggs and and so on. Assuming there's no issues with dairy, I've been I've been wondering, uh, sort of along those lines, whether the reason that we use um, glucose preferentially to ketones, uh, so if we if we eat any any mm -hmm. sugars, then we we use them first. I wonder if it's because the body is actually trying to eliminate them from a from our body, yeah. Uh, because uh, to to leave the ketones alone to to look after us in the best possible way, yeah. Certainly our brains. Well, it's an interesting thing because I think about glucose now, and and look, my my thought process around this has definitely changed since going through my nutritional training, and then you know <clears throat> through all the research and knowledge and stuff that I've done over the last ten years or whatever. Um, it's changed from the very beginning. But part of that is that understanding that our liver has to get rid of glucose like it needs to get rid of alcohol. And so I think of like the liver has got this to-do list and every day it's got to clean your blood and it's got to do this and it's got to do that. And it's got this to-do list. And if we drink alcohol, the whole everything that's on our to-do list gets moved to the bottom and the alcohol has to go first. And if we yeah. eat glucose, everything else on the list gets dropped down and the, the glucose has to go first. We have to filter that and fructose out first. And so it does slow down our liver's capacity when it comes to detoxification. And so it's got to do those things first. So it's part, probably part of the reason that glucose becomes a primary fuel service because we've got to get rid of it first. So there's less work for our liver to do. Yes. Yep. So that makes sense. 
So with all that in mind, if somebody was starting to think about carnivore for themselves, what would be some of the things that you would suggest for them to do that would help them along on their journey? Uh, I think um, eliminating foods one by one is, yep. is a good idea. You certainly want to get rid of any starchy um, carbs as soon as possible because yep. you'll, you'll see the most benefit from that. Uh, but look, it took me four years to, to um, on, on sort of keto-ish, uh, dirty keto, mm -hmm. to get to where I bit the bullet and, and went full carnivore. Um, so I, I find it hard hard to uh, to tell anybody else to do differently. Once I did go full carnivore, ovo carnivore, whatever you want to call it, then uh, then I found that the easiest of all. I had, so you, if you've got the courage to do it, go whole hog, go boots and all. But um, but it won't hurt if you if you ease yourself into. It. Yeah, I think that that's an interesting thing because like there's I was the whole hog person. I'm like, let's rip the band aid off. We're starting tomorrow. Let's go. Um, yeah. But I also was in a situation where I needed to start changing my health immediately, or I would be on medication. And my personality was one that was like, I am refusing medication. I'm not going there. Um, so I'm going to do this. <laughs> um, but also there's merit to the slow and steady approach as well, because you build in habits and you build in routine and you start to build in skill sets that you might need. Like, and I'm surprised that there are people that don't know how to cook a steak. And sometimes they've actually got to give themselves the opportunity to learn how to do those types of things and how to learn how to cook them in a way that they like them. Like, for example, my husband, um, his mother always cooked meat so that it was like you could throw it and it would bounce back at you. Yeah, like, yeah, you know, hockey was, puck, yes. yeah, yeah. <laughs> hockey puck, I like that. But, you know, it was rubber. And then when I cooked meat for him, it was like, oh, because he never liked meat before that. And I'm like, no wonder because it takes really a like while. That. <laughs> and so you know sometimes you've got to learn some skills on how to prepare the food in a way that you like it I love that you know that yours is six minutes um, in the air fryer I know exactly how many minutes to cook like a nice steak in um, to get that to my level of perfection um, right. <laughs> but it takes time to kind of learn and adjust to what do you like and, and try things out and so on and that slower steady approach can actually be quite helpful and I think we need to kind of let go of the carnival police and the diet police that say you have to do it like this. No, there is no rule that you have to do it like that. It's whatever works for you is how you do it. I I had a real shock when I when I hit um, eighty kilos, which was mm -hmm. sort, of, sort of my target. I I thought I'll have a piece of chocolate to celebrate. <laughs> How did and, that go? <laughs> I, well, I, I had a paradoxical reaction to it. I thought it was meant to make you um, loose, stall, and it didn't. I bound me up for three days. Yeah, it was dark chocolate, but but even yep. so, so I now carry the wrappers from that chocolate around in the glove compartment of my car. To remind As a reminder, not, not to be such a bloody idiot in the future. Oh, <laughs> I love it. Not, and, and it's not a reward, you know. Yeah. The opposite. Exactly. I think, though, we all kind of need to have that type of experience. Like, I think sometimes, like, everybody needs to have one of those types of experiences where you eat something that you used to love, that you've been, like, you know, maybe playing with in the back of your mind. 
And when you do, it never tastes the way that you think it's going to. It never does. Like you've, you've made it taste better in your brain than it actually does in real life. And it never does the thing that you think it's going to either. So I think like even those are learning experiences. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I used to binge, bingey chocolate. Or well, whatever was there. Really. But uh, I don't miss it now. Yep. And I think like that's part of that addictive cycle is kind of getting rid of the, the chemical part of it and then the habitual part of it of like, well, what do I do on a birthday now that I'm not having this? Well, for me, I really like a big giant tomahawk steak and try and challenge myself to eat it. I never care, <laughs> but <laughs> it's my challenge for my birthday is to try and eat this deliciously juicy tomahawk steak. And I end up you know, inevitably having to share it with everybody else because I just can't finish it. Uh, well, the but... hardest bit is getting your jaws working for so long. <laughs> well, and that, that's, I think it takes time to, to figure those things out. Like I love that you take a birthday cake for the men shed people and then watch them eat it. Oh, I watch that. I get enjoyment from watching other people. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, but I do feel guilty. Yep. <laughs> so I'm curious if there's anything you'd like to add or touch on before we start to, to close today. Um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I use kilograms now for everything. And mm -hmm. I know that I was um, 13 stone at 13, 14 stone at 14. 15, 16, yep. 17, I added a stone per year, which is six and a half kilos. Oh, and wow. I also, added, I also added four inches a year uh, in height. So I, I just grew like topsy. Um, so I've never done the comparison before. So last night I saw what what is 80 kilos, what I am now, in terms of the stone, and it was stone. 13. So I am now the same weight as I was when I was 13. Oh, but wow. I'm foot, but I'm a foot taller. Wow. Um, yeah. Were you a big boy? Like, were you, were you yes, big I, when yes, you were a I teen? Played, played second row rugby. And, yeah. Uh, nowadays, I wouldn't make it on the wing. <laughs> <laughs> too, too light because they're huge. But no. uh, but in those days, yes, I was a big boy, big boy. How tall are you? I used to be six foot four. I've shrunk a bit with age. Uh, 180, awesome. 187 yeah. centimeters. Yeah. I was just I was just doing the conversion because I'm like I'm yeah. one sixty eight. <laughs> so oh okay. That yeah. twenty centimeters taller than me. <laughs> yes. Yeah, you're the same sort of height as my mother was. Yep. People used to be terrified. Five foot ten? Yeah, something like that. Yes. Um, people used to be terrified coming into our house because all the men were six foot or above, and my mother was <laughs> like dead. <laughs> oh, land of the giants. <laughs> and not helped by the fact that it was a 400-year-old house. With low beams, which is why I've got a line across my. Oh floor. no! <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so we took up all the room in the house. I love it. I love it. <laughs> so I know before we got on, you were talking about medication. Have you dramatically reduced your medication? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't think I will ever be able to stop taking my um, beta blockers for the heart yeah. because they, that, I've got AF and it races away. So that's yeah. why I've got, the, I've got the pacemaker to keep it up and I take yeah. beta blockers, um, two different beta blockers to keep it down. So I'll be on that forever. But yeah. I'm slowly, slowly dropping, dropped um, my uh, diuretics, um, dropped the crest or the statin, yep. dropped 
Atacan, which was blood pressure medication, because uh, I kept fainting. As I, as I started to lose weight, I kept fainting. I thought, do, do you think I could drop these? I spoke to the doctors, yes, probably would I. <laughs> I, I, I was getting, um, um, when, I, when I stood up, I, I got yep. faint. Yep. Uh, and my uh, off the Zempic, off the injected uh, um, um, medication for the diabetes, uh, off uh, other tablets, I was on glycolyzide. Yeah. Uh, or diabetes. I'm only on metformin, and I've got permission from my my endocrinologist to titrate down. So six point five, I think, is is sort of okay as a yeah. as a. I'd like it to be lower. If it drops below six as an average level, then I will halve my metformin, and I've got permission to do that. Uh, I had I've a loved, patient once I've, who. Um... Their doctor prescribed them metformin and they decided that they wouldn't take it. And they went back to their doctor and he said, oh, I think we need to double your metformin dose. And he's like, that's fine. Taking any of it, so double of nothing is still nothing. <laughs> and, then he started, and then he started carnivore and they're like, oh, that metformin's really working. And it's like, I'm not taking any of it. Fantastic. Because their, their blood glucose dropped enough. But yes, like met. Like when it comes to your fasting insulin, it's all about your liver, like what's happening in your liver. And so the healthier your liver gets, the, the less glycogen it needs to boost out in the mornings to, to get you going. So it'll start to drop itself down. Well, that's why I stopped taking the statin because it it, it tends to increase your diabetic mm -hmm. um, response. Yep. And diabetes is a, is a much worse risk than high cholesterol. Yes, I'm, absolutely. I'm, well, I mean, all this is is YouTube doctors talking, but but, but LDL but, doesn't even hit the the top five risk factors for heart disease. Like, not yeah. even in the top five. So why isn't it such a why is it such a drive because, for this thing that doesn't even hit the top five? Because big pharma make a lot of money out of statin. I know, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> After after uh, COVID, um, I'm tinfoil hatter. Wow, welcome to the club. <laughs> <laughs> Just running down. Well, I, st I still take blood thinners. That makes that makes sense. Yep. Um, and I still take some inhalants for chronic obs um, obstructive pulmonary disorder, COPD. Yeah. Uh, although I think I probably don't. Because my my sleep apnea was gone, I don't sleep on the mask. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, one by one, I'm dropping medication, and I still supplement a lot. I supplement a lot with um, with vitamin D. I take yep. um, something like double the recommended um, level of vitamin D uh, in my system. And um, and I take ivermectin uh, yeah. as a poor one because you can't buy it in tablet form, but you can buy it at the um, at the farm shop. <laughs> and not not a sniffle since I started. Since I started, I've taken ivermectin. Not a cold. Everything passes me by. No flu, and the vitamin D. And yep. zinc and, mag and magnesium and, and so I take quite a lot of quite a lot of supplements, K two, um, B twelve, yeah, uh, methylated. Um, what else do I take? Oh, there's a couple here. Oh, uh, coenzyme Q ten and uh, N acetyl cysteine. Yep. Um, and some of those are really appropriate for those that are listening at home going, oh, but I thought that I would need to take no supplements on carnivore. The difference is it's where you start in your journey. So perhaps if you'd started maybe 30 years ago before you had some of the issues that you have and started, you know, the medications that you're currently on, you might not have had to take some of those supplements. But 
it depends on where you are in your actual journey as to what you need to take. So, for example, if you're listening at home going, oh, that sounds like a lot, CoQ10, you need CoQ10 to rebalance statins. So if you've been taking a statin, the, the statin is going to deplete your CoQ10 in your brain, which is going to make you, you know, go into Alzheimer's and dementia and, you know, all of those other issues that we yeah. don't want to have happen to our brain. So we've got to rebalance some of the, the damage that gets done by some of those medications as well. I've probably got very expensive urine. <laughs> <laughs> but also too, like, you know, for example, when I'm thinking about you wanting to come off metformin, the anacetyl, um, the knack essentially that's going to help you know support your liver as your liver gets healthier the metformin can come out because your blood glucose is going to reduce overnight um and, and so on so you know there, there's a there's reasons for those things to actually be there to help you reach some of your ultimate goals but even things like your um beta blockers and your um blood thinners they're going to deplete you of some of these other nutrients and sometimes you just need to rebalance those to, yeah. to bring back what you're losing because of the medication, which at this point in time, you're not really going to have that much of a choice to be able to get off of some of those. Thank you. I don't sound quite so stupid. <laughs> you're, not, you're not stupid in any way, shape or form. But I think that that's a common thing for a lot of people is that they're like, you know, oh, I shouldn't have to take anything if this is an optimal diet. But we all come to it at different times in our lives. Like, you know, some people were lucky enough to to get it in their twenties and thirties, like Dr. Chafee, for example. Oh, um, yeah. Others, others of us, like even even I, didn't get to it until you know what was I forty two when I started carnivore, um, and at that point in time, I already had advanced diabetes. I should have been going. I should like my blood glucose was twenty one point one as a fasting, like that was my fasting blood glucose. And I should have gone to a hospital and gotten on an insulin pump, but I'm like, hell no, I'm just going to go and eat carnivore. Uh, and I, because I, I know I've walked that journey with with a bunch of patients before that once you start on insulin and once you start on those things, it takes a lot longer because you've got to do this balancing titration act of like titrating yeah. down your insulin and so on to get off of it versus if I don't start it in the first place, I know I can can avoid that roller coaster ride a little bit more. Um, by just going hardcore and so that's I what i did who, i have a friend who um, was told by his doctor well we might as well put you on insulin because you're going to end up there anyway and awesome what, what a shocking doctor well um, the sad thing about that is that they have this belief that insulin does no harm when too much insulin in your body kills your brain it kills your single organ so too much glucose damages your double organs. Too much insulin uh, damages your single organs. So that's like your liver and your heart and so on. And majority of people who have diabetes, they've had a really high insulin for a good 10 years before they actually get a diagnosis of diabetes. So we're not even looking at the root cause of diabetes because we're not looking at what people's fasting um, blood insulin actually is. Um, but then doctors have this idea that insulin does no harm and it's not the case. You can literally kill yourself with insulin. So oh, how can no. it do no harm? Do you follow Ben Bickman, Benjamin Bickman? I do I do know of him a bit. I've listened to some of his stuff, yes. Yeah, he's, uh, well, he, he's very influential to me, talking about the evils of insulin, effectively. Yeah. Um, and what my my aim is to reduce my insulin to minimum level, as I said. Yeah. Yeah. And that's by what, by that's... the way, I did I was at one time on 80 units of of um of insulin, insulin injected per day. Um yeah. and I don't enjoy in, in, injecting myself. Yeah. I did it for a couple of my pregnancies, my last one in particular, because I was bed bound, like I wasn't able to use yeah. exercise as a tool to manage my blood glucose and so on uh and i was like yeah no nah, not doing this again <laughs> this is the, this is the end of this not doing this again um but it's interesting like yes there's a need for insulin for people who have type 1 diabetes for example where you know their pancreas has been oh, destroyed yeah, sure. by some type of autoimmune condition um, and, you know, there are a need for some of these things, but I think that we we are in a society of of over-prescribing versus looking at what's actually driving that, what's actually the cause there of, of that scenario and that situation 
and looking at changing our lifestyle so much easier just to inject you and shove tablets into you than it is to like you know help people actually change their lives there was a paper i read a long time ago right at the beginning of my journey of a doctor in newcastle in england newcastle on time who was performing uh, lap up uh, um stomach banding oh yeah uh, and noticed that he was curing diabetes at the same time because then people... why would that be <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah um so he so he followed followed up with uh, a lot of uh, te tests and came to the conclusion that stop eating sugar and you fix these um, problems like and before you we had stop having diabetes yeah yeah Funny, yeah well it's interesting that before we had things like injectable insulin like the the medical practices method of dealing with diabetes was basically a carnivore diet like it literally yeah. was basically a carnivore diet pr prior to the invention of insulin and it's the same with epilepsy before the invention of antispasmodics the keto was the diet which was fairly similar to carnivore uh was what you would do for those people like that that's just how they had to eat <laughs> and we, we we then get these drugs and now eat whatever you like and we'll just inject you afterwards it's fine <laughs> there'll be no consequences yes yes it's, it's a silly model and it's, it's a circular argument mm. uh, eat, eat these che cheap mass-produced foods and um, and take take these tablets and everything yep. will be fine but it's not true it's same exactly it's the same as what i've had with oncology patients where they go to their doctor and they say i'm working with a nutritionist and she's given me this dietary proto protocol to follow and they go no just eat whatever you like it'll be totally fine you can go to mcdonald's and have double whopper burgers and blah 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 mm. um, and it's the number of times where I've seen patients who have gone from like doing really well because they're eating like keto slash carnivore diet, they're doing really well with their outcomes. They go to an oncologist and the oncologist says, no, eat whatever you like. And they trust what the doctor says. And then suddenly they, their cancer spirals and takes off. I'm like, does that not say something to you? <laughs> Do you use GKI? Yeah. Yeah. I, oh. I use GKI a lot with oncology patients, but I think that the mental challenge about trusting what the doctor says is still really cemented into a lot of people's brains. And yeah. the challenge is that I'm like, your doctor has not studied nutrition. Your doctor is most likely not even reading the latest research about how ketosis actually protects you. Even if you're going down the pathway of chemotherapy and so on, how ketosis actually helps to protect your healthy cells from the ravages of chemotherapy. And they're probably not reading those things because it's not in their field of spectrum. Their spectrum is they're trained on the, the drugs and how to use the drugs. They're not mm. trained on how to use the food. The cancer loves glucose. Exactly. And so if you don't feed it any, then you uh, it, the cancer dies, not you. Exactly. The I, mean, I watch my... My poor wife, who you will see is still, still a big influence on yeah. me, um, suffer through radio and chemotherapy. And chemotherapy yeah. is essentially, let's kill as many cells as we can, hope most of them are cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and you've got uh, enough and, uh, healthy cells to come back. That's the hope. Like, yeah. Well, you can you can edge the bet the better better if you thought, if you're in ketosis in that moment in time because you're protecting what healthy cells you do actually have left. Um, you know. Anyway, it, it's a so, it's a bugbear of mine and a personal frustration, but you can a, only do what you can do. There's an American doctor who who pushes a pump philosophy of um, of ketosis interspersed with some medication mm. and I can't remember what his name is it begins with an L um, yeah. I think a Germanic name uh, 
and he and he suggests that if your GKI is under under three, then uh, then cancer just yeah. can't survive. You 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 can actually cure or put yeah. into remission cancer. Yeah. Well, there's there's two types of food for cancer, just depending on which one it actually which type you actually have. Predominantly, like more about eighty percent is a glucose based one, but then there's a around about a 20% um, one that is more protein-based. And that's where you've just got to, you still want to be in a GKI of under three, closer to a one as possible, um, but you've got to do protein sparing. So you've just got enough protein that you're sparing the muscles on your body, but not enough to actually become a food source as well. Um, oh, okay. But but that's less common. Like that's really only, you know, it's more about 15 to 20% of those cancers that are that one, majority are the, the glucose-based ones. Um, so that but, would be almost a pure fat diet. Yeah, not quite. It would be about you, you, your goal is about twenty between ten to fifteen percent um, protein, but it just it just depends. Like I usually yeah. will do the math on how much somebody is weighing uh, has as to how much protein well, we want that to be. Thank yeah. God, at the moment, all I have to worry about is uh, just to see the, uh, <laughs> yeah, just, yeah. just eat, my, eat my steak. Pour the fat, pour the fat out of the pan onto the steak, and then yes. spoon it up afterwards. Yeah. So, so I don't waste any of it. Yeah. It's where all the taste is, anyway. I think so as well. I think so as well. Anyway, we're coming to the end of our time. I'm seeing my little real reminder is flashing me up going, time for your next client soon. So oh, I'm going to say goodbye to you. Thank you so much for the, for the conversation. I look forward to checking in with you on how you're going with your progress over the next year or so, uh, just to see like what other things you've been able to, to manage to get out and so on. Um, so if you're okay with me checking in with you, I would love to check in and see how you're going in maybe six months' time. Um, yeah, oh, quite crikey, it's like we're an hour and 20. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's time for me to take my uh, take my beta blocker. <laughs> Good. Thank you so much, and we will say goodbye. I will talk to you again soon. Bye nice, for now. Nice, nice talking to you. Yeah, bye-bye. You too.